Portfolio Composer, episode 166. You're listening to the Portfolio Composer podcast with your host and coach, Garrett Hope, where he teaches you what it takes to master the business end of writing music through mindset, marketing, and business skills. Make sure to sign up for the newsletter at theportfoliocomposer.com for exclusive offers, business insights, and information not shared on the podcast. And now for this episode of The Portfolio Composer. I would say that talking and connecting first on a personal level is more important than telling them, oh, I'm this great composer, you should check my reel and all that stuff. Time is very... uh, uh, is very valuable. So no one is going to, oh, you know, I met this guy that, you know. So the, the approach would be, what can you uh, what can you do for them rather than the other way around? And what connections you can have with these people? Hello and welcome to this episode of the Portfolio Composer. I am your host, your coach, your teacher, Garrett Hope, and I'm so excited that you're joining us again today. Thank you for giving your attention to this podcast and the things we're doing. I am doing this to help you and to help myself to try to answer the question, what does it mean to be a composer in the 21st century and how do we go about building our businesses so that we can be successful? Today's interview is with film composer Aldo Schlaku. Welcome, Aldo. Thank you for having me. Oh, it's my pleasure. Aldo (laughs) Schlaku has composed music for many feature films, documentaries, and TV programs. His music can be heard in films such as Lupin Three, Paranormal Asylum, The Blue Hour, and On a Dark and Stormy Night. Schlaku's music scores have received the gold medal for excellence at the Park City Film Festival, and then Pirate for the Sea, Stillwater and Trespassing, A Kiss on the Nose, and Paper Boat. That's really tremendous. So congratulations on all that success. Thank you, Garrett. I'm really interested in your origin story. How did you come to be a film composer? Uh, Well, I was born uh, in Albania, in Europe, this little tiny country in Europe, and uh, in an artistic family. Both my parents are actors, theater actors, and my brother is a painter. So so when I was about six years old, my father noticed that I was um, hitting the table and keeping the rhythm whenever there was music on TV. So uh, he's like, oh, okay, we got something here. So he sent me to auditions and he enrolled me in the music school. So that started my uh, music education. Um, uh, At the time in Albania, we were um, under a communist dictatorship and the the education system was basically um, just a copy of the Soviet uh, music methodology. Uh, So I started Mm -hmm. with classical trumpet and piano. And uh, we would start uh, our practicing schedule at 4.30 a.m. And we would finish around 8 p.m. Are you, are you serious? As a child, you started at 4.30 a.m.? Yes, yes. Because um, we had to do about three hours before the general classes would start at 8 a.m. And then general classes would go until 2 p.m. And then we had uh, the music classes like harmony, theory, uh, counterpoint, uh, trumpet, piano, whatever, until like 4 4 p.m. And, and then you had to do another three, four hours of your own practicing. So it, it was an insane experience. I, I would call it a day, maybe borderline abusive. Yeah. <laughs> but but uh, it was the norm and it was the only choice we had then. So, um, so that's how, uh, that was my upbringing, <clears throat> basically. Um, and another reason was because um, instinctively, it was like automatic pilot because... My family was one of the many Albanian families that were marked as anti-communist or enemy of the state and stuff like that. So we had people, uh, members of our family that were executed. My father was sent to labor camps for seven years, was expelled from the theater as an enemy of the state and stuff like that. So so we had no choice, but I remember him saying, uh, if there is one chance for you two, for both of us, basically two brothers, you just have to be uh, somewhere on the top so that they cannot do anything to you. If you're on the top, they, they can't touch you, basically. So, And that's how uh, we had to do it. And um, But then we were lucky that the, the wall of Berlin fell and the family decided to uh, leave Albania for Greece. And that's where I actually had my first Western experience. Wow. 
Yes. So, um, yeah, I moved to Greece and um, uh, it was like a very, um, like a cold shower. It was like an awakening because um, it was a totally different system, totally different country. We did not know one word in, of Greek and uh, we had no idea how things would work. And uh, yeah, and everything, but basically what we went to Greece, we sold everything. Uh, the family sold everything, and about 65 years of work for my parents amounted amounted to a total of $800. So that's how much we had as a family to start a new life in the West. Oh my goodness! <laughs> yeah. So uh, yeah, but it was one of those moments that you actually uh, realize that okay, this is the time now for you to 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 stand up and provide for the family for your parents because you cannot expect from them not to start a new life, you know once they've already had a new, uh, another life. Uh, so, yeah, we arrived in Greece and uh, we started looking for a job. I, I want to kind of ask a question about this traditional Russian education you got as a very young child. Yes. Do, is part of that curriculum, and I'm, I'm assuming this is some sort of like St. Petersburg-based conservatory curriculum, Yes. Uh, so did that include composition practice as well beyond your counterpoint yeah. exercises? Yes, of course. Uh, but, but however, though, it, it included everything. It was the Russian school of thought, but it would, uh, our training would end to, at uh, Wagner. Uh, once we reached Wagner, there was only one sentence. And after this, there was Wagner. That was it. Because Wagner was considered as... Um, as a, uh, a composer that was not fit to be listened by uh, masses under a communist regime. So we had all the romantics, we had all the classics, we had Bach, we had Beethoven, Mozart, uh, everybody. But we would end up in the late 1800s. So even, even the great 20th century Russian composers, you didn't study them at all? No, not allowed. Wow. Not allowed. Yeah. Not allowed. And so after Greece, your musical education continued. And how did you then get to Canada? We bought the bicycle and I started exploring uh, each block uh, with that bicycle, riding it and, and all that stuff. So um, after about a week or 10 days riding this bicycle, I found this new uh, this, uh, this sign uh, that had a trumpet and a piano, this club billboard that had a, a a trumpet and a piano. So I went in and I saw this band rehearsing. I asked for the boss, for the for the band leader, and I said to him uh, in English, "I'm I'm a trumpet player and a piano player. Can, I'm looking for a job. So, you know, uh, so what can I do to be hired?" So he's like, "Oh, go get your trumpets." So sure enough, I went out, rode my bike, went back home, grabbed my trumpet, went back to the club, and sure enough, the band had left and, and it was dark and there was only this person in there. And he said, like, where did you go? What happened? So I said, well, I went and picked up my trumpet. Only then he realized that I had actually, uh, my house was about 15 kilometers away from the club. So um, once I had ridden about 45 kilometers on the bike that day, <laughs> <laughs> he, <laughs> he, gave, he gave me the chance to, to actually uh, evaluate me, my, my trumpet playing, my sight reading my improvisation ability, my piano playing, my music dictation ability, because I needed to take down, um, to, to do sketches off the tapes, of the songs that they wanted to perform. So I had to write down the sketches for a six-piece band, six band and, and so on. So I got hired, and uh, that's how I started, and uh, had my first real disappointment after that, because I was paid uh, only $7, playing every night f from 10 to 5 a.m. Oh my and God. Whenever, yeah, when everybody else was getting paid $100 a night and so on. So I was like, that's it. You know, I'm not going back and all that stuff. And uh, it was my father who said to me, oh, okay, well, you're not going back. Okay, well, you know, I'm your father and I'm working for $3 a day. So you're doing what you love to do, music, and uh, and nobody know in a country that nobody knows or ever heard of you. So, and... You're complaining? Yeah, for twice the amount. Exactly. So I was like, you know, that that was it. Like basically, okay, what am I talking about? And then and then actually he added to that, well, he said, there, it's a win-win situation, he said. So yes, you're being used, but it's a win-win situation. You know, at the end of the day, you may end up being the champion 
of this nation in in bike racing. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, so, forty five kilometers, and then you play trumpet after that too. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So so yeah, I ended up working at this place for one year, and uh, periodically my my way my my payment was raised and. People got to know me. It opened it opened up for many many opportunities for me. After that, I started recording in a studio, and I actually started giving my time, volunteering my time in that recording studio, for in return for studio time for myself. Okay, I want to and interrupt you is, for a second before you continue. Yeah, what style of music was this in the club? Oh, it was everything. It was Latin, it was pop, it was Greek folk, it was uh, you name it. Some everything classic. that you didn't study in conservatory. Yes, it was like a like a like an awakening, like serious awakening. I had this studio time that I was being given as part of my my work there for free, basically, and uh, I was using the studio time to record my exercises and my auditions uh, to be sent to Canada. So I kept my chopped up my my, my chops on trumpets uh, by going to 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 the city beaches to 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 rehearse because you know I didn't want my neighbors to call the police on me. So I would go to the beaches outside the city and and do my four or five hours of trumpet playing and stuff like that, and uh, and send this exam. This at the time you could send a tape in for for foreign students. I sent my exam, recorded it at the studio, mailed the tape, and uh, I was accepted at McGill at McGill University. And uh, once in Montreal, I transferred to Université de Montréal because I really wanted to study composition under a specific composer there, Dr. Michel Longtemps. And uh, it was actually in Canada, once I moved there and I started studying, that I really found myself in this position to finally search and become the man and the composer I am today. Because I had the time, I had the, the, I don't know, I found my peace and I found my, finally, it was not anymore about rushing or survival or to make ends meet and to, to ride a bicycle for 50 kilometers a day, stuff like that. So, uh, and I was lucky enough that Michel, my mentor and my professor at the Université de Morale, uh, was there for me because he totally um, walked me through finding my language as a composer. Uh, he nurtured whatever was worth keeping from my past, uh, showed me new paths or what I could do as a composer in Canada and, 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 and abroad. So with his recommendation, I was also selected to be part of the Domaine Forget Composition Masterclasses, where I studied with, um, uh, with uh, Cornelis de Bond and Denis Boulian and uh, the Ensemble Modern under Laurent Bayancourt. Uh, did some more extended studies in new music composition and really found myself basically. So, wow. so I, what was this like for you who, I mean, you knew common practice music inside and out, you knew uh, Mediterranean folk music inside and out, and now you were getting exposed to 20th century music for the first time, including these Russian masters. What was that experience like for you? The six the first six months at Universidad de Moral, I was actually complete, I had a complete blockage. I could not write a single note. It was because uh, here I am studying now composition in Canada, uh, being, and at the same time, of course, doing theory and all that stuff, Schomburg and Stravinsky and uh, all the masters of the 19th, of the 20th century. And here I come from, you know, stopping my studies at, at Wagner and uh, it was a complete blockage. I could not write anything without a structure or a harmonic formula. So for six months, actually, with Michel, I had to really, he had to actually tell me, you know all this. Yes, great. Now forget all about this. <laughs> <laughs> so, so he opened actually that window for me and he walked me through, uh, yeah, he walked me through this transformation that, uh, you don't have to write music because of a structure and because you have a, a, a hammer over your head. You, you, you have to be yourself now and use the knowledge to express yourself and, and, and think of music as just another part of, of creation and base your creation on math, on, on science, on books, on, on other mediums, basically. So open, open your horizon and think of music as a language that, that, 
that is yours now. It has nothing to do with, you have to do this because Beethoven did this, for example. Okay, so we've been in Albania. You've traveled to Greece to get away from the communist regime. You ended up in Canada to study music. And you're, there's more to the story. Uh, well, the story goes like this, that I did not want to go through the teaching path. I had a talk with Michel and uh, he knew my upbringing and so on. And he said, well, you have two paths. You can either go through your master's, through your PhD and, and become a teacher because you have to support yourself or you can, de- you can do whatever you say that you always wanted to do, write for the theater and for the, for the screen and, and follow your heart. And that was a decision that uh, we took and we picked three options, which was London, Boston, or USC in LA. And I decided to visit these schools first before I I would commit to one of them. And it happened that I visited first USC. And I came here, had spent a full day with uh, Buddy Baker, the the head of the program at the time. And uh, it was like an an amazing experience. Uh, I spent two weeks at USC, um, saw their recording sessions they had at at, at Paramount Studios at Stage M. And uh, talk some more with Buddy Baker and uh, discuss music. And it was very friendly. We discussed music. We discussed a trumpet piece that I had written, a uh, concerto in three movements that he seemed to have liked uh, when he saw it. And, he, and then he told me, just go across the, the street and uh, there's some papers working for you over there. So I went there and they asked me to sign. I signed. And then all of a sudden, he says to me, well, you're in the program. I'm like, oh, this is... <laughs> But once I went in and once the program started, then I realized that I was lucky enough to be one of the chosen ones. We were 13, international selection, and I loved my time in, at USC. And I was lucky enough to be one of these guys, and I was lucky enough to have met one of my teachers there, Christopher Young. He became uh, my mentor, and he became my employer after that. And he said to me right after school that, look, if you're looking for a job, you have one right here. And Chris, being one of the most generous people I've ever met, you know, he offered me everything I needed. So uh, I worked for Chris for about four or five years, uh, worked with him on projects like mm-hmm. Spider-Man 2, Spider-Man 3, The Grudge, The Core, and assisted him also on preparing the USC class that he still did. And it was that experience that actually prepared me for the move into the real world. Mm. So yeah, I assisted someone basically through school. I met someone, I assisted someone and here I am. Right. How do you think your experience growing up in that Russian conservatory style has impacted your writing voice today? When it comes to film music, um, it's actually, it's been very beneficial because for certain genres, let's say drama or even action, uh, the idioms are pretty much the same. So it's tonal music. It's it, We still use tonal music when it comes to the drama. And, and seldom we find dramas that have atonal music or, or sound design-ish style. Like, for example, there will be blood, for example. You can't say that that's a tonal score. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, but I would say most of the dramas are are based on tonal music. And tonal music... It's, you know, the masters, it's romantic. It's the romantics, it's the classic, the classics. So you you will go even to, <clears throat> you'll go to um, Beethoven, even Mozart for romantic comedies and, and Vivaldi for certain other things. And so basically the tradition is there. But when it comes to other genres, uh, like horror, for example, or thrillers, the atonal music is very much into play because you have that experimental canvas in front of you and you are more, you're, you're more free to, to experiment with sound, with techniques. So what I learned as I was studying composition in Canada, actually I see that being applied today in whatever I've done. Uh, downrange, for example, my latest project that we just premiered at TIFF, I'll, I will explain if you need me to, but the technique was very much a technique that I've applied during my studies in Canada. Uh, but when it comes to other projects, let's say um, another film I did uh, with uh, Jean-Claude Van Damme, Kill Them All, straight action, it's very tonal, it's very thematic. Uh, yeah, so that's... 
Well, talk to me. How, talk, tell me about your technique that you used for Downrange, which is one of your latest films, right? Uh, yes, yes. Downrange just premiered at uh, at the TIFF about two weeks ago, and uh, I was lucky enough to have a few months to work on the score with uh, for that project. Uh, the director and I, we go back about seven years. We've done three, four films together. So we, we pretty much know each other and what our sensibilities are and what we like, what we dislike, and so on. So uh, it's a movie about a deranged sniper that just shoots people, basically. So uh, the story takes place in, in one spot. It's one location, and uh, that's it. It's in the span of one day, and it's uh, from from bad to worse, to worse, to worse. That's hmm. how the story goes. So as soon as he was telling me this concept about this new film that he wants to do, uh, I told him, look, I don't know what I'm going to do and I don't know what you're going to do, but I do know that this rifle has to be center, front and center of the score. And he's like, I love it. I love the idea. Great. So when I came home, I'm like, oh my God, what did I just do? How am I going to do a... <laughs> yeah, I mean... <laughs> You can't do a score with just a rifle. So, and then what I did is uh, I looked at the title, and the title is Downrange. So I'm like, okay, so rifle is my uh, rhythm section. All the sounds from the rifle, I decided to sample the rifle in every way possible and use only those sounds for my rhythm section. Uh, but I had to do, I had to uh, look for melodic material and for harmonic for a harmonic language. So for the melodic material, I decided to use the title of him, Downrange. And looking at it, I noticed that I had four pitches already in the title, which is D, A, G, and E. And I'm like, okay, so I have four pitches. And I said, oh, how about some serial music here? So, but I couldn't do a serial uh, matrix with just four pitches. So I decided to go with seven because of, uh, Stravinsky had done a piece with seven pitches. Yeah. <laughs> so, so uh, here is you know me going back to my upbringing now here in my my studies, and uh, I used a, a math formula uh, that consisted of the correlation of the remaining three letters of the title with the English alphabet and how they fit in the English alphabet. So by using another formula after that, I kind of came with the seven note series and then I made my prime out of that series and then from the prime the matrix was derived mm -hmm. however I was missing one letter which is which was R uh, the letter R and that's when I said oh I got to bring in the director and three actors to do some vocal performances of this letter R and the title itself downrange and uh, we sampled them we had a recording session. We sampled them in every way possible, and we run these recordings through sound design mm -hmm. plugins and stuff. So we created these textures that I use them as my harmonic um, space for this serial approach and this rhythm that was derived from sounds from the gun. Mm. So that's how the score was built, and. Uh, one concern I had, I told the director, I said, uh, please do not change the title <laughs> <laughs> because the whole concept would collapse. So he's like, no, I'm not going to change the title. No, this is great and so on. So, yeah, but he's a very creative, he's a very creative director and he always pushes you to actually um, find approaches that he's never heard or, or seen or read about it before. So, I was able to do this because two two things. One, I had the time, and two, I had the director that actually was like on board from the get-go. Wow, that's great. What has been one of the biggest lessons you've learned in doing film music as, a, as opposed to concert music? Oh, film music, it's actually, um, it's not about you. It's not about you as a composer. It's you have to shift your focus on how to serve the project. And uh, if you want to do music for yourself, you can just do concert music, you can write a quartet, you can write a piano sonata or something or whatever you like. But film music, you have to serve a higher purpose, which is the movie. At times it may not make sense to you. At times you may say, oh my God, you know, they're telling me to change this instrument or this, this 
or to take out a certain you know stem or whatever but you know what i've 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 learned by now that um, they know better than me mm. <laughs> they know better than me uh, and that has to do with the target that they have to bring this movie um, to or the market or the the whole concept why are they making this movie and the music is just one of the parts it's an important part but it's one of the parts it's not the most important thing yeah i love that and i think you're 100 percent right and i know for myself who i write in the concert world and i do some independent film scoring that's mm -hmm. one of the hardest things to do is to get myself out of the way yeah actually uh the difficulty i i have consistently on every score is how to tone it down because it's very easy to that that composer self uh, takes over and you're like you know and you're writing a note and writing a note and another note and then add a counterpoint line two three uh, and and then it takes over and then you're like oh wait a second they're just mm -hmm. talking about let's meet in five minutes you know <laughs> so yeah <laughs> keep it simple right so, exactly so you got to keep it down uh, yeah. you got to keep it simple and serve that purpose serve the what what you have in front of you as you've built your career once you moved to LA and you finished USC and you were working with Christopher Young what do you think were two or three of the things that you did um, or that you wish you would have done that have helped your career move forward well i would say the, the 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 first one which i do on a daily basis is you have to invest in yourself um, be that either by getting the best education you could get, uh, be that by getting the best gear uh, to create your music with, or or actually invest the time to be as proficient as you can in the latest music technology. Uh, I would say this would be the 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 the, the first step on on being in a position that you can actually finalize a score and do it do it properly and do it like a like it's your business um if you don't invest in yourself you're never going to be able to um to to do a score simple as that mm. so that would be number one number two for me would be um you need to master your craft to the highest possible level and um, and be able to output the highest quality of music uh it, this is a necessity um, for example, it used to be, uh, when, when I was at USC, we were told uh, continuously that uh, you have to be able to output two minutes of music a day, and this has to be broadcast quality. Two minutes a day. If you cannot do two minutes a day, you cannot uh, maintain a career in the film and television industry. Um, today, that minimum has gone up. I would say it's about three to six minutes at times even more. That's a lot of music. Uh, absolutely. But you know what? Uh, once they come in and they say, we have, you know, two weeks for you to do the score. Uh, what are you going to say? That, no, I need three months. You can't. Um, you got to say, of course, I will do it. And then hang up the phone and say, what the hell did I just come <laughs> into? You know? So, uh, and the third one I would say is the one that we composers, we completely... Uh, leave it behind uh, it's the we need to be proactive in creating opportunities uh, we can't wait for for opportunities to fall on our lap uh, you have to go out meet people talk to people uh, you have to be in be present in industry events screenings panels uh, you never know who you're going to, going to connect with you never know who uh, who's going to hire you uh, who, which meeting is going to bring what in terms of potential work, in terms of collaboration in the future. So I would say these are the three um, main things that you need to run a business as a film composer. Okay, a couple follow-up questions. And the first one relates to your second point, which was mastering your craft. Yes. What do you do on a daily or almost daily practice to continue mastering your craft. I mean, you've done a lot of work since the time you were five or six years old to become an expert, but you have to keep that edge sharp. So what are you doing every day? So my day uh, starts with uh, with uh, lighting up two, 
to incense. I love incense, and I come into my studio. I light two of those incense, and it puts me in the in the in the in the mood of okay, now in my in, in my cave, this is my sanctuary now. Okay, so it's a it's a state of mind first, and of course I have to approach. You have to approach every project first uh, intellectually. You have to really think. Okay, I'm trained to do this. Um, I have to take this as uh, there is no better person than me to do this. They're trusting me with their baby. So here I am. So you have to put yourself in a state of mind first. And then to keep your, your craft to the highest possible level is that you have to split the day one hour to read what's new in the music technology. Uh, let's say uh, give time, allocate time to different aspects of your functioning, be that half hour practicing piano, be that an hour to, to keep your trumpet chops up, uh, be that um, reading a little bit about the, the technology, uh, be that listening to some of the latest scores that are out there and see what others are doing so that you're in current with the latest sounds out there. And, you know, and even if you have some time, just put the headphones on and listen to Mahler. <laughs> <laughs> can't go wrong with Mahler. Uh, you can't. No, absolutely not. <laughs> okay, and then I want to follow up on your being proactive in creating opportunities because I agree I think no one is going to open doors for you. You have to open your own doors. And you had mentioned being present at networking opportunities and going to film screenings. Um, what are best practices for networking within the media world? Do you approach people and hand them your business card? Do you have a reel ready with a website? Do you hand people CDs? How do you navigate that? Uh, I think I think before you even go to business cards and and reels and stuff like that, I think the most important thing is the personal connection. So you go to these events and uh, you meet the people. And I would say that talking and connecting first on a personal level is more important than telling them, "Oh, I'm this great composer. You should check my reel and all that stuff." Time is very. Uh, uh, is very valuable. So no one is going to, oh, you know, I met this guy that, you know. So the, the approach would be what can, you, uh, what can you do for them rather than the other way around and what connections you can have with these people. I know, uh, I, I know of examples that say that people ended up working for, for huge, big, big name composers just because they shared a sailing interest, you know, or... Or, or a soccer interest, or some some other things that are completely unrelated to music, for example. So, um, in my in my case, with this director that I'm, I've worked four times now, uh, our shared interest was music, but it was progressive rock music. Yeah. You know, it was it was the '80s. We met and we we're talking about Pink Floyd, and we we're talking about you know Simple Minds, and we we're talking about all these groups in Dire Straits, and you, and we never talked about what what that what I could do for him, you know, or me asking for a job. So it was an accidental meeting with him uh, through another submission that I had sent to another person that, that project never materialized. Two years later, I sent an email saying Merry Christmas to that producer. And he said, Oh, by the way, you know, I'm working on this project now with this director. You want to meet him? And I said, sure, of course I want to meet him. So I met with this director. We never talked about movies. We talked about music. And uh, sure enough, I've done four films with him now. So you never know, but you have to, because look, to have a website, to have a kick-ass reel, to, to be top-notch in what you do, that goes without a say. I mean, to have that side of the business taken care of, that, that's that's not even a subject for discussion. You have to be top of your game. So it, it's both adding a, or creating a personal connection, but I, one of the things I was reading in the subtext of what you were saying was adding value because you said, how can you help these other people you're meeting? So it's connecting with something that's beyond an outside music as well as helping them meet their goals. Absolutely. Absolutely. You have to, uh, I would say, I would say instead of, of, you know, complaining or instead of thinking why I'm not being hired and all that, you know, uh, first of all, you should be in a position to, to say, okay, well, how about I even get a job as a PA assistant or be on a, on a, on a, on a, 
on a film shoot set, you know, and just maybe help in the production. What can I do? You know, I know this sounds maybe a little, a little bit out there, but these are the things that these people want. And for them is making a movie for you. It's how can I give the music and how can I be famous? But for them, it's making a movie. And actually I'll, I'll plug in a little bit of, of a personal story here. Uh, by accident, I've produced two feature film films here in LA. You produced? Yes, by okay. accident. <laughs> exactly. So because of those two productions, I submitted a project in one of the most pre prestigious producers workshops in Europe, and I got selected. Uh, it was a one-year program where it developed a film project from idea to script to packaging it to hiring all the collaborators starting with the director and to making the marketing plan for the film, to realizing the financial plan and to finally find the co-producers for the film because it's a European system, you need co-producers. You know what? I got to tell you, once I went through this, uh, through this experience, a one-year workshop, it, I, I still think it's one of the best things I've ever done professionally because it has made me um, see firsthand how the composer's position is evaluated from the other side of the fence. And it has changed completely the way I approach a project and has made me a better composer. Okay, um, I, I have to dig into that. Uh, this is so valuable. What, what are a handful of the things that you've learned that have opened your eyes that I can, I can use as I move forward as a composer? The most important thing I would say is that uh, when working as a composer on a project, you, you approach it from, from bottom up. You approach it from your music is the ceiling and, you know, this is it. So your ceiling is how to make great music. That's it. When you approach it from the producer's perspective or, or, the, or the director's perspective, the music is seen from top down. Their ceiling is actually something completely different that you're not aware of. You're not aware of, you're, you don't know what they have gone through. They've been on it for five, ten years, three years, whatever. You don't know how much they've risked to make this movie work. And dealing with you is just one little part of that whole major undertaking. It's a huge risk for them to give you the score of that movie. You better be on top of your game. You better be accommodating all the time and make sure that this huge undertaking uh, is enriched by that part that you have to play. Because that's your job. I'm not saying you have to compromise your artistic, um, your artistic vision or your, your, uh, your input and everything. I'm saying that you have to find the cracks and a way to make your artistic inputs the best you can within that context. It's not about the music. The music comes last, <laughs> unfortunately, unfortunately. Right. So it, it comes last. Even actually, even on a day when you're working on a score, in my case at least, writing the music is actually the last thing. Hmm. It's, it's funny uh, how this thing goes down, but it's the last thing, and it's actually the easiest thing of all. So... Uh has this perspective you've gained from having the role of the producer, has it influenced the way you approach contract negotiations and money? Absolutely. Of course. In what way? Uh, well, it's made me, first of all, uh, producing music, it's kind of similar to producing a film. That's how I ended up accidentally producing two features. Uh, you have to hire people. You have to hire musicians. You have to negotiate with them. You have to make sure that everything is in place. You have to be nice to them, but at the same time, get what you're paying them for, or you have to you know, sell yourself and motivate these people, give their best uh, for your score. This is in terms of a composer hiring the musicians and, and making it work. In terms of a producer, you have to see the general picture. You have to, music is one of the factors that will, will, will make the 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 the, visu the visuals that the DP has given you will will cover certain problems will add certain value will will um, 
draw some attention that will benefit you as a producer for you know as a filmmaker when you sell the movie when you try to to distribute the movie and all that stuff so once you're part of that concept that the movie is these many pieces that somehow have to work together you see yourself as part of the whole picture you don't see it anymore as i'm just trying to do the music and i'm out of it no you're actually part of the we got to sell this movie we got to make this movie available for people to to see it we got to you know we got to push and and me making a great score or working for free at times or or doing four times what i've been paid for it's it's for that goal it's for that general goal and you got to give your best whatever it is paid not paid uh, horrible conditions or or it doesn't matter once you've committed to you have to really give all you all you've got because if these people hiring you or 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 giving you the chance to write that score for their film they've given it all they have so it's um it's an honor to actually be uh selected to to score a film that's how i see it it's 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 an honor and it's it's something that uh i do know that once i've spent 10 years on putting a project together a film together it's not easy for me to trust someone with my baby mm. so you better take that seriously <laughs> right so wow this has been a tremendous conversation i'll do and uh oh, I thank really, you I, I think you and I could keep going, but at some point we have to wrap this conversation up. Uh, but why don't we take a quick break right here and then we'll come back for the lightning round. I am in the process of booking speaking gigs and seminars and workshops for the spring. If you are an educator and would like me to Skype in or visit your classroom or school to talk about the business of music, setting yourself up for success after graduation, what it means to think like a small business owner, branding, marketing, or mindset, send me an email. You can do that most easily through the PortfolioComposer.com website. There's a contact page, which allows you to fill out a form and send me a quick email. I'd love to discuss this with you further before all my time gets completely eaten up. Uh, I look forward to hearing from you guys. Thanks. Welcome to the lightning round. All right, Alda, what advice would you give your 20-year-old self? Um, go out more often. Yeah, did you spend too much time practicing or what? How, I mean, uh, how, what did that look like? Absolutely. I started, I started, um, I started networking here in LA. And, and before that, I, I was completely focused on, on practicing, playing, uh, doing my thing as a musician. And, and uh, I think that part of a musician's life today should be going out there and meeting other people. What is a personal habit of yours that you feel leads to your success? I say that, um, and I believe this, you are what you do, hmm. basically. And, and everything that bears your name should, should be something that you are proud of it. So one thing that you should do is just give everything you have, regardless of the conditions or resources that you have. Nobody will know or nobody cares what conditions you had to work under. What they will see or hear is what's on screen and when they hear your music. So make sure that you've given it all, uh, all you got because that's there to stay forever. That reminds me of the phrase, the way you do anything is the way you do everything. Have you heard that? <laughs> exactly. Absolutely. Yeah, the idea, like if you're going to do this sloppy, does that mean you do everything in your life sloppy? <laughs> So yeah. you're a trumpeter and you're a pianist, but what is an instrument you have always wanted to learn to play and why? Uh, I would have loved to be able to play acoustic guitar mm -hmm. simply because of that connection with the fretboard and that little sound, that soft uh, sound. And of course, um, it's again that fret that actually made me not play the guitar because I, I, I get goosebumps when when i hear that fret noise <laughs> so <laughs> so I, I so i can't stand it so i stay out of the guitar hire george deering and you're set for life it, so <laughs> it's never too late but you know what that's why i don't play double reeds because it tickles my lips too much it's just, oh but there there you go <laughs> what is one composition that had a profound impact on you and why uh well for me actually there are two little pieces that i heard when i was a kid that that completely uh put me in this 
state of mind that, oh my God, this is like magic. Um, it was, as I mentioned, my parents were actors. So uh, during my childhood, my mother would take me in her theater tours because my father could not keep two kids. So they had to split. Um, and I, I would watch these theater plays on a daily basis, like over and over and over again. And there was this play by Arthur Miller, uh, The Death of Merchant, that you know, I was seeing for you know, like a month. And when the main character comes in, 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 into his house from this journey he, he had just completed, they would play music off a tape. And that piece of music was Schubert's Serenade. And I mean, that impact... In the impact of that music on that scene, seeing it with the actor just coming into the house after two years of traveling and, you know, and they, they would just let go of that Schubert serenade was like, oh my God, this is like magic. Every night I was mesmerized. I think uh, <laughs> most American audiences refer to that as the death of a salesman. That oh, that's right. That's right. The yeah, salesman. Yeah, yeah. You got it. You got it. So, uh, yeah. And the second piece when I was a kid again was, it's a ballet, it's a Russian ballet called Lola by Sergei Vasilenko. And when I've seen that ballet, the first time I actually experienced ballet, I was like seven, eight years old. Um, it was mind blowing. Oh. I think those were the two moments when I'm like, I don't know how, but it has to go somehow that way. You know, I have to write for, for the stage or for the screen somehow. Yeah, that's lovely. Yeah. Can you uh, recommend a book that could benefit the podcast listeners? Uh, well, I have three. Oh, great. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, well, uh, one of them, actually, that was an eye-opener for me is a little book called The Wealthy Barber. It's a, it's a, I don't know, $10 book from Amazon. And it actually tells the story of this barber, wealthy barber, that as he, as he's giving haircuts, he explains to you how you should put your, your financial life in order and how you should run a business and, and so on. For me, coming from you know Albania, Greece, Canada, all, all music all day long, reading this book was an eye-opener. How, how you should deal with insurances, with cash flows, with uh, corporating, corporating LLCs, all these kind of things. Uh, it, it was actually a first step for me to looking into this more, uh, more in detail because uh, I still run my business based on that book. <laughs> it's very simple. Nice. But it's very, uh, yeah. The second one actually would be um, a fiction novel by Eric Maria Remarque, The Arch of Triumph. Um, it, it's based in the, right before the Second World War, and uh, it's about this surgeon in, in Paris, this German surgeon in Paris, and how he has to do surgeries uh, underground and uh, to make a living and, and so on. It's such a beautiful book that everybody should, should read and, and see that, you know what? we have a great life here and we're doing what we love and there's always somebody outside our vision that is suffering somewhere. So we have it okay here. So we should be happy with what we do. And the third one is of course the on the track by Fred Carlin. Well, that's a great it's, book. Yeah. It's something that every composer for film or TV or, or, or video games should, should read a couple of times. Yeah. I have that on my shelf. Yeah. Um, can you recommend a, a piece of music or a composer that is either a minority or female composer you think we should get to know? Well, Rachel Portman, <laughs> she is, oh. she's known, she's known. Uh, I've say, loved her uh, scores for years. Of course. I mean, a, a class act composer, yeah. very, 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 very uh, well-written scores, very, very uh, beautiful orchestrations. Everything is in place very, very true to the style and so on. And another one would be Terence Blanchard. Uh, Terence Blanchard, you know, great, great stuff. Awesome. Jazz influenced, yeah. Where can people go to find you on the internet and how can they get a hold of you? I have a website, uh, www.aldoschlaku.com and on Facebook with the same, same name. Uh, as we wrap up, I'd love to give you the floor if you have any final thoughts or words of advice you'd like to give to composers. The only advice I, I would give is that uh, everyone should just believe in themselves and uh, just give it everything they have and not worry, am I going to make it, I'm not going to make it, and so on. Just be true to yourself, just follow your heart, do your thing. If, if you're a composer, that's what you are. It doesn't, you don't need validation by 
other people. Just if you're rejected, and this is a, a long road of rejections, the film composing path. <laughs> if you're rejected, that has nothing to do with you as a composer. You can always just grab a piece of paper, grab a pen, and and write a quartet, and and just keep the fight on, and 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 keep walking the line. And one day it's gonna come. It's gonna come one day. Just hang in there. I love it. Well, this has been a wonderful conversation. I've enjoyed it a great deal. Thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Garrett, for the invitation. Thank you. <laughs>